The Subcommittee on Technology and Innovation will come to order. Good morning. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, Are We Prepared? Assessing Earthquake Risk Reduction in the United States. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I'd like to welcome all the witnesses here today for this hearing. In light of the devastating effects of the recent earthquake and subsequent tsunami that struck off the coast of northern Japan on March 11th, many countries are examining their own level of preparedness. It is always a challenge to measure how prepared we are for the next unexpected event and whether current ad efforts are adequate. The scale of the human tragedy is difficult to comprehend and our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Japan. Although earthquake risks vary across the country, portions of all 50 states are vulnerable to these hazards. 26 urban areas in 14 different U.S. states face significant seismic risk. My own district in Arizona does not lie on top of a major subduction zone or fear the threat of tsunamis. But I believe today's topic is important for all of us. Earthquake catastrophes have the potential not only to destroy lives and buildings, but also to wreak havoc on civil and industrial infrastructure and the national economy. In Japan, the after effects of the quake have reduced supplies of water and electricity, hampering the ability to export many manufacturing products and forcing some businesses to slow or stop operation altogether. Supply chains for important technology products here in the United States have also been interrupted, directly impacting our productivity. The impacts and consequences of a major earthquake are felt on a global scale. These hazards, consequently, represent a serious threat to both national security and global commerce. Given our current economic situation, it would be even more painful for the United States to endure a disastrous earthquake, the socioeconomic effects of which would reverberate for decades. This committee has supported ongoing work amongst four federal agencies focused on researching and developing techniques to minimize the devastation of earthquakes. This includes improving forecasting, supporting the development of effective hazard reduction measures, engineering disaster re resilient buildings, and furthering our basic understanding of earthquakes and their effects on people and infrastructure. Coordination of these elements is important in order to effectively deal with these hazards and communication be between federal, state, and local stakeholders is critical. Much of the federal research and development effort is housed in the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, also known as NEHRP. This program coordinates the earthquake hazards reduction efforts of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the National Science Foundation, the United States Geological Survey, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Coordination of these agencies' work provides the public and private sectors with the necessary scientific and engineering information to prepare for earthquakes and thus hopefully reduce their impact. NEHRP was last authorized in 2009, and while the House passed reauthorization legislation in last Congress with bipartisan support, it was not considered by the Senate. We have an excellent panel of witnesses today who will examine earthquake risk in the United States and review efforts supporting the development of earthquake hazard reduction me measures. We will hear perspectives from the director of a federal program created to reduce earthquake hazards, a state geologist, an emergency management professional, and a structural engineer and member of a national advisory committee overseeing earthquake engineering programs. I'd like to extend my appreciation to each of you, each of our witnesses, for taking the time and effort to appear before us today. Thanks again to our witnesses for their participation. I look forward to a productive discussion. With that, I now recognize the ranking member of this subcommittee, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wu, for his opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this uh, very important hearing to assess the state of earthquake risk reduction in the United States and our readiness. And thank you to our witnesses. Uh, many of you have traveled a long distance to be here with us today, and uh, I appreciate it very much, as does the rest of the committee. Our hearts go out to the Japanese people as they continue their work to recover and rebuild from last month's devastating earthquake and ensuing tsunami. 
the loss of life and property is a stark reminder of the destruction that can be caused by a large-scale earthquake, even in a country like Japan, that is on the leading edge of earthquake preparation and mitigation. And this uh, tragedy certainly forces us to take stock of our own vulnerabilities. As an Oregonian, I am particularly concerned about the prospect of a similar disaster occurring in the Pacific Northwest. Off the coast of Oregon, Washington, and Northern California, we have the Cascadia subduction zone, and this fault is currently locked in place, uh, but research over the last 30 years uh, indicates that the same stress now accumulating has been released as a large earthquake about once every 300 years, uh, dating back to the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. The last Cascadia earthquake uh, occurred 309 or 10 years ago. It was a magnitude 9.0 earthquake, the same destructive magnitude as the one that uh, struck Japan. All indications are that uh, Oregonians can expect another quake uh, anytime. It's a matter of when, not a matter of if. When the next earthquake occurs on our fault, there will be a prolonged shaking, perhaps for as long as five minutes, with the potential to collapse buildings, create landslides, and destroy water, power, and other crucial infrastructure and lifelines. Such an earthquake will also likely trigger a devastating tsunami that could overwhelm the Oregon coast in less than 15 minutes, resulting in potentially thousands of fatalities and billions of dollars uh, in damage. Unfortunately, this type of uh, disaster scenario is not limited to the Western United States. In fact, more than 75 million Americans across 39 states face significant rate risk from earthquakes. The good news is that we have already learned a lot about how to prepare for, mitigate, and respond to a large-scale earthquake. There's a lot of work already underway to help us better understand earthquakes develop safer building standards, and ensure that affected communities can respond to and recover from earthquakes as quickly as possible. The National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, or NEERP, lovely acronym, uh, has driven us to make significant uh, progress uh, in this area. I expect that we will hear testimony today that the four uh, NEERP agencies, uh, NIST, FEMA, NSF and USGS are making significant strides with at-risk communities by developing new hazard maps, model building codes, and public outreach efforts. I have no doubt that the progress we have made through NEARP has advanced the safety of our communities and will save lives. NEARP's good work must be continued. That is why I have reintroduced the Natural Hazards Risk Reduction Act which will reauthorize the NEAR program. This bipartisan legislation passed the House by an overwhelming margin in the last Congress, and already this year my bill has been uh, introduced in the Senate where they are moving quickly to mark it up next week. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this subcommittee and full committee uh, and in the Senate to get this bill signed into law as quickly as possible so that we can continue addressing the large challenges that remain, retrofitting existing structures, improving the performance of critical infrastructure, and encouraging the adoption of mitigation measures by households, businesses, and communities. And I might add here that I am particularly interested in education measures, education that can reduce casualties from earthquakes, but especially along the Oregon coast, where appropriate education, not only of the coastal population, but of the populations in the valley, uh, well, what we call the valley, uh, where a significant number of people vacation on the coast is particularly important uh, so that people will head for high ground immediately after the ground starts, uh, stops moving so that they can uh, have a good chance of avoiding uh, the ensuing tsunami. We are here today to engage in a productive discussion about where we stand, particularly in relation to other countries that have uh, suffered large-scale earthquakes, 
in terms of our preparedness and resiliency to earthquakes and what more needs to be done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing, and I look forward to the witness testimony. Thank you, Mr. Wu. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses, and then we will proceed to hear from each of them in order. Our first witness is Dr. Jack Hayes, Director of the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Next, we will hear from Mr. Jim Mullen, President of the National Emergency Management Association and Director of the Washington State Emergency Management Division. Our third witness is Mr. Chris Polin, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Degenkolb. I got that right? Very good. Degenkolb Engineers and Chairman of the NEHERP Advisory Committee. Our final witness is Dr. Vicki McConnell, Oregon State Geologist and Director of the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Thanks again to our witnesses for being here this morning. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each. After all witnesses have spoken, members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Dr. Jack Hayes, Director, National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Chairman Quayle, Ranking Member Wu, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today to testify on the state of earthquake risk reduction in the United States. My testimony reviews the impact of the NEHER partnership that includes FEMA, NIST, which is my home agency, NSF, and USGS. This partnership also includes other federal agencies, state and local governments, non-governmental professional organizations, model building code and standards organizations, and earthquake professionals in private sector and academia. NEHERP fosters unique cooperation among the four program agencies, with each agency having a crucial role that complements but does not overlap or compete with the roles of the other NEHERP agencies. Briefly, NSF supports relevant basic research in the earth and social sciences and the rele relevant engineering disciplines. The USGS carries out earthquake hazards assessments, earthquake monitoring and notification, and targeted research in those areas. NIST serves as program lead agency and develops and tests earthquake resistant design and construction practices. And finally, FEMA promotes the implementation of earthquake safety tools and policies, focusing on the development of earthquake resistant building codes and practices. NEERP has an interagency coordinating committee consisting of the leaders of each NEERP agency and the directors of OMB and OSTP. This committee, the ICC, provides overall program direction. NEERP also has an external advisory committee that provides independent assessment of our work and recommends warranted program changes back to the ICC. The current chair of the advisory committee, Mr. Chris Polin, is also a witness at this hearing. We have developed a strategic plan that guides our partnership. As stated in that plan, our vision is to create a nation that is earthquake resilient in public safety, economic strength, and national security. How are we achieving this vision? Significantly, NEHERP is not a regulatory body. We develop, disseminate, and promote knowledge, tools, and practices for earthquake risk reduction, working through coordinated, multidisciplinary interagency partnership, both internal to NEHERP and with our stakeholders. We emphasize resilience or the ability for a community, region, or even the nation to recover in a timely manner from the occurrence of an earthquake or other hazard recognizing that this is key to long-term sustainability. Attaining resilience requires coordinated application of planning, mitigation, redundancy, robustness, and response and recovery activities. Our NEHERP annual reports, website, and other publications cover our activities. While I summarize some recent program highlights in my written testimony, time does not allow me to review them in detail with you now. Of course, I'll certainly respond to any specific questions you may have later. During the last 14 months, we have seen devastating earthquakes in Haiti, Chile, New Zealand, and Japan. We offer our sympathy to these nations and their citizens who have been affected by these events. Despite their tragic consequences, these events teach us numerous lessons that can be applied at home. There are many technical and scientific aspects of these earthquakes that we are investigating, but two overarching lessons are already clear. First, these devastating earthquakes strike without warning and often at locations where their full impacts are not expected or understood. Second, 
earthquake preparedness and resilience measures can greatly reduce earthquake impacts, human suffering, and societal and economic disruption. The purpose of NEHRP is to ensure that we are prepared and that we do not have to relearn those two lessons here at home. Chairman Quayle and other subcommittee members, thank you again for the opportunity to testify on NEHRP efforts to reduce earthquake risk in the United States. This concludes my remarks, and I shall be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Jim Muller, Director of Washington State Emergency Management Division and President of the National Emergency Management Association to present his testimony. Thank you, Chairman Quell, Ranking Member Wu, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today regarding earthquake preparedness. I am President of the National Emergency Management Association, and we represent the state emergency management directors of the 50 states, territories, and the District of Columbia. I've submitted my written statement for the record already, so I'll take advantage of this opportunity to summarize my statements and leave some time for questions. The initial phase of an incident, whether it's an earthquake or a tsunami or a hurricane, usually involves the lights and sirens of response, and while firefighters, law enforcement officials and emergency medical personnel bravely constitute the traditional first responders, emergency managers provide the all-important function of coordination. Emergency managers often manage multiple events simultaneously while preparing for a wide range of hazards from floods and earthquakes to Category 5 hurricanes and terrorist attacks. The response to an incident usually includes three phases of escalation. First, the local jurisdiction responds with immediately available assets. Should the local jurisdiction become overwhelmed, my counterparts at the state level are available to provide more robust state capabilities. On occasion, an event will even overwhelm the state, and this is usually the only time in which the Federal Emergency Management Agency is called upon to offer assistance. Without broad coordination by emergency managers during the response phase, uh, and this escalation of assistance, uh, the transition from response to recovery would be nearly impossible. In my written statement, I go into more detail on the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program and other witnesses have and will address it specifically, but I'd be remiss if I didn't stress the importance of Congress reauthorizing this program. Without adequate authorization and funding of NEHRP, the collaborative work done by several federal agencies and institutes could leave communities without a critical source of research and technical assistance in earthquake preparedness. This work is invaluable during the planning for a response, but irreplaceable during a disaster. Programs such as NEHRP and the response and recovery issues I just discussed will be on display this May during a national level exercise throughout the mid-central United States. This exercise is sponsored by FEMA and through the simulation of a major earthquake on the new Madrid seismic zone will test the policies and doctrines of the federal government in eight states. This endeavor will involve thousands of government officials at the federal, state, local, and tribal levels, members of the private sector, and the general public. Once this exercise is complete, I'm quite sure the committee will be interested in any after-action report FEMA can make available. Exercises and programs such as NEHRP only go so far, however, in establishing a baseline capability for response and exercise efforts. Each year, Congress supports one of the most critical programs the federal government has to offer. The Emergency Management Performance Grants, or EMPG, allows state and local emergency managers the ability to enhance their capability to protect lives and property. This coordination between state and local emergency managers is critical prior to an event. Since inception, EMPG has required a 50 percent non-federal match, and many state and local jurisdictions regularly overmatch. To give you an idea of the impact of EMPG, consider the following examples. In 2009, 59 disasters occurred which required a presidential declaration and federal assistance. At the state level, however, 180 disasters required a gubernatorial declaration but no federal assistance, and another 122 events required state resources but no declaration. Without solid capabilities at the state and local levels afforded through EMPG, these events normally not requiring federal action could need significant federal expenditures. As you can see, the emergency management process is co complicated, and while I strayed somewhat from earthquakes specifically, this demonstrates the need to be prepared for a wide range of events, from the initial response to the transition to recovery to the various levels of support, support FEMA can offer and the programs such as EMPG and NEHRP help states stand on their own. There's much we can accomplish if that program continues. The emergency management team stands ready to continue assisting you in Congress in ensuring the safety and security of millions of Americans against a broad range of hazards and threats. I thank you for this opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. I now recognize Mr. Chris Poland, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Degan Kolb Engineers, and Chairman of the NEHRP Advisory Committee for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of the American Society of Civil Engineers. 
Over the course of my structural engineering career that began in the early 70s, the goal of seismic design has undergone a radical change. When I started working, it was all about keeping people safe. Since then, the primary goal has expanded, expanded to also include protecting communities so that they can recover quickly, and that's a much more complicated problem. This transition brought with it the need to design parts of the community to be undamaged and immediately usable. Other, per, other portions to be usable while being repaired, and the majority be usable after repair. The community's lifeline systems need to be designed so that they can be restored quickly and support recovery. Achieving this goal is the focus of the current National Strategic Plan for the NEHR program. We believe that it's in the federal interest to continue pursuing resilience for the sake of national security, interstate commerce, public safety, economic strength, and community restoration. I'd also like to point out that this work will stimulate jobs and protect neighborhoods, protect people, and the small businesses that serve them. You've asked us to comment on whether we think we're prepared, and, and what I can say as a structural engineer is that depends. We are certainly more prepared than Haiti was prepared. But at the same time, we know that we're nowhere near as prepared as Japan was prepared, and we know what happened in Japan. For me, I don't think we're prepared for a nation uh, to, to face a major earthquake and the impacts that it'll have. The vast majority of our building stock and utility system in place today were not designed for earthquake effects, let alone given the ability to recover quickly from strong shaking and land movement. The tools and process we have available to achieve those goals are honestly too expensive to implement. Each earthquake brings different styles of shaking and new insights into the performance of the built environment. Each event reminds us that there is a lot of uncertainty about what causes failures, and that generally leaves the profession developing conservative solutions to the problems they observe. That's what causes the very expensive price tag. Considering, uh, continuing and expanding the significant ongoing research will lead to engineering tools and, and processes that will allow the needed cost-effective solutions to be developed and implemented. Last week, the National Research Council of the National Academies released a study that recommends a roadmap of what needs to be done to implement the NEHRP strategic plan. The NRC lists of needed activities is comprehensive, and it certainly justifies the reauthorization of the NEHRP program. They have called for a 20-year program that moves at a much faster pace than NEHRP is currently proceeding. On behalf of my clients who seek to achieve resiliency at an affordable level, I fully support the, NEHR, the NRC recommendations and call for a faster pace. We need to accomplish resiliency in our nation, and at the pace we're going, we're not going to accomplish it, maybe ever. I recommend the NRC programs address, I, I, that the, uh, I recognize that they, they address four fundamental needs of resiliency. They point out that we need to significantly increase our ability to gather information, data, catalog it, store it, on what happens. Extensive instrumentation is needed to understand how strong the earthquake shakes everywhere after an event. We know the shaking is different in every block of a city. You can tell that by the damage that occurs. And right now, we only have a handful of instruments in each city to tell us what's happening. In addition to that, a network of operation centers is needed to record, catalog, and maintain information related to the impacts on society and their response just cataloging how a community responds and recovers to an earthquake, that process has never been done in a coordinated manner. We need that information. We need a framework that defines resilience in terms of what is needed to recover. Resiliency is more about improvisation, adaption, and redundancy than about how any single building or system performs. We design single buildings and systems, but we need resilient communities. We should not spend money on things that we can improvise around. A consistent national framework for measuring, monitoring, and evaluating community resilience is needed to guide the development of the new tools and processes. This is a fundamental need that we have. We need social science research to quantify the role of improvisation and adaption and to determine how decisions are made. Achieving earthquake resilience requires community-based, holistic approach to response that includes decisions and actions that are based on overarching goals, a clear understanding of the built environment, rapid and informed assessment data, and planned reconstruction and recovery. Research on the gathered data will allow lessons to be learned in one community and transferred to the next. That's a process that doesn't go on right now.
Finally, we need to develop performance-based engineering design tools that can be used nationwide. For the past decade, engineers have been developing performance-based standards, but these early efforts have been severely limited by insufficient data on building performance, insufficient analysis tools to predict performance, inadequate training in the use of developing techniques, basic research, extensive full-scale testing, applied research, and implementation programs are needed to complete the development of the standards that will make achieving resilience affordable and cost-effective. I appreciate the opportunity to present our views and urge you to recognize the value of the work, the extraordinary work that needs to be done, and, the, and to reauthorize the NEHRP program. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poland. I now recognize our final witness, Dr. Vicki McConnell, Oregon State Geologist and Director of Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries for her testimony. Um, thank you, Chair Quayle and uh, Mr. Wu. <clears throat> and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. And thank you for this opportunity to comment on the state of earthquake risk reduction in the United States to discuss the importance of the coordination between federal, state, and local stakeholders and <clears throat> for emergency preparedness and allowing me to recommend improvements to federal programs. Um, as stated, my name is Vicki McConnell and I'm the director of the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries for, Dogo for Oregon. We work in close partnership with several federal programs that are focused on earthquake hazards characterization and risk reduction. We implement those programs at the state and local level. I am also representing the Western State Seismic Policy Council, whose mission is to develop seismic mitigation policies and share information to promote those programs intended to reduce earthquake-related losses through 13 Western states, three U.S. territories, and the Western Canada. This council serves as a shining example of FEMA and USGS funded programs through NEHRB that assist in reducing earthquake risk in the US. And even though I am the Oregon State geologist, um, I want to just remind you as a geologist that earthquakes and the hazards caused from earthquakes care little about state or national boundaries. You have to really look at the full geologic regions, and we have to think about national investments in risk reduction. First and foremost, I want to stress <clears throat> excuse me, that the return on investment made by building resilient communities is tremendous. By definition, resilient communities spring back, and they cost much less. The cost is minimized to get everyone back up and running. So my primary recommendation to you is to maintain robust federal programs within the National Science Foundation, NOAA, NIST, NASA, FEMA, and the USGS that address earthquake and tsunami hazard research, mitigation, and preparedness, particularly the cooperative federal to state and local programs that implement those federal missions and goals. It is now estimated that the fatalities in Japan from the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami may reach 25,000, and the economic damage may reach 300 billion. And as has been stated before, our hearts go out to everyone in Japan and our condolences to their losses. We did not, we did not escape unscathed here in the United States, though. We uh, had tens of million dollars of damage in Hawaii, Oregon, and California, and we had one fatality, all of that from the tsunami, from the earthquake. Um, although it's going to take time to assess what has happened in Japan, it is clear that Japan's research and development, their technology and preparedness saved hundreds of thousands of lives and damages that would have gone more into the more billions from that earthquake, something that we need. It's our take-home lesson from that. And as Mr. Wu summarized, we have very similar geologic and seismic areas off the northwest coast of the continental United States and the coastline of Alaska. We have, in historic times, both witne well, uh, witnessed a uh, 9.0 magnitude earthquake on the Cascadia subduction zone in 1700, as well as the 1964 9.2 magnitude Aleutian, Alaska subduction zone earthquake. We also now realize that magnitude eight and higher earthquakes can occur along these same areas. 
And the reason we know that is because of the NSF and USGS funding opportunities for basic earthquake science. I want to quickly go through some of the programs that are important for these, uh, for what we see. NSF's research at universities to understand and monitor earthquakes. The USGS Advanced National Seismic Network, our crucial seismic network. The USGS Earthquakes Hazards Program, which has uh, external grants that brings in local uh, expertise in science and engineering. And the NOAA Tsunami, Tsunami Warning Program and the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program, which really is our leading edge for understanding and mitigating tsunami hazards. Uh, finally, we don't forget about the NASA fleet of Earth observing satellites and their help with these. I want to thank you again for this opportunity to comment on the nation's earthquake preparedness and the federal programs that assist building resilient communities. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McConnell, and thank you to all the witnesses for the testimony. We're going to enter into the question portion of this discussion, and we want to remind members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point open the round of questions, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Dr. Hayes, I want to start with you. In your testimony, you talked about the importance of collaboration and, and linkages amongst NEHER partners. Um, there's interagency coordinating committee, an external advisory committee on uh, earthquake hazard reduction, and four federal agencies that have responsibility for long-term risk reduction. And I was just wanting to know, is, is there any redundancy um, in these efforts, or do all agencies play a distinct role um, in, in NEHERPS? It's a good question. Um, in my written testimony, uh, I actually posted what has infamously been referred to as the wiring diagram for NEHERP. I understand from our legislative affairs people that the Commerce has never let such a figure be published in, in testimony before, but it's a good graphic representation of what NEHERP is and what it does. I don't think there's any duplication of effort among the agencies. I think that there are complementary activities at the four agencies. The National Science Foundation is responsible for basic research, but it's also responsible for training the next generation of leaders in this area for our country, and that's a ex really, really important part of what they do. Uh, FEMA, on the other hand, is at the other end of the spectrum, if you will, and FEMA is responsible for the implementation efforts, and FEMA works very, very closely with the National Model Building Code organizations, uh, particularly the American Society of Civil Engineers and uh, the International Code Council, to get the results of, of NEHERP research into the, the National Model Building Codes and then get adopted by states and localities around the nation. In the middle, USGS plays an extremely important role in the whole process with its monitoring program, its hazard mapping program, uh, the work that it's now doing in the early, early stages of trying to understand how early warning might be implemented, it's an extremely valuable part of the process that is not duplicated in the other agencies. Finally, my agency is responsible for doing applied R&D, if you will, to, to bridge the gap between the, the, the basic research done at the National Science Foundation and the really applied work that's done uh, at, uh, at, at uh, um, FEMA. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Poland, in your testimony you were talking about looking at the differences of, of the results of the earthquakes in comparison from Haiti and Japan, and then even going back if you look at what happened in the North Ridge quake and the quake that happened in San Francisco as well. Um, but you also mentioned that it would be cost prohibitive to retrofit the buildings that uh, across the United States. I mean, what, what is your suggestion in terms of being able to minimize the repercussions of an earthquake? Is it just looking at the where different communities lie within the faults? If they're close to San Andreas, obviously you take different things than uh, something in middle America that's away from the new Madrid fault line. As I mentioned, the, uh, the biggest problem we have is that the built environment that we have right now in the country uh, has not been designed for earthquake effects, both in terms of public safety and in terms of being able to recover and resiliency. And so the biggest problem we have is, is what do we do with 85 or 90 percent of our buildings and systems that are not adequate for, for the kind of performance that we want? When I spoke about the being cost prohibitive, I was speaking about retrofitting those buildings and those systems so that they can perform properly, and that's what costs so much money. The most important thing is to, is to not fix or retrofit anything that doesn't need to be fixed and not to do it too much, mm -hmm. if I can say that. Okay, how do we stop doing it too much? 
Uh, the first thing is that the earth science research has to continue to move forward to expand our understanding of how strong the ground is going to shake, what the, the damage to the land is going to be, and what the impact on the buildings is going to be. So that, that needs to continue so that we can better understand where the pockets of, of shaking are going to occur. Right now we consider huge areas that are going to shake very hard. And in reality, when we look at the damage and we look at the instrumentation that's available, we see that there are pockets of damage that occur. So there's a whole body that needs to be done there. Secondly, is just the techniques we use to analyze buildings and determine how much they need to be retrofitted uh, is based on anecdotal evidence that we gather from our field reconnaissance. We go out and we look at earthquake damage. We see broken buildings, don't know how really how strong the ground was shaking, and determine what we need to do to stop that. Through full-scale testing and uh, basic research and applied research, we can learn and have learned a lot about how to improve building performance just enough. And it's this just enough idea that will bring the cost down and make it affordable. And, and along that, because you were talking about basically doing the whole community uh, awareness, and so that are you talking about, since you don't want to do too much, is it focusing on one specific pocket that will resist um, a certain level of earthquake so that it can be up and running post-earthquake, and then you basically prioritize different pieces of infrastructure so that the, the cleanup and uh, the repair work post-earthquake can happen in a much more efficient manner? That's correct. And, and, and the focusing is really around the, the systems and the buildings that are needed for the recovery. The, the buildings that you need during the emergency response period need to be running all the time. Uh, the, the big issue that we have right now is we recognize that our workforce, that the neighborhoods need to be restored uh, within a few months in order to, for the economy to come back to life. And so the systems that support the neighborhoods and the small businesses need to be taken care of next. And then the commercial districts and the industrial areas need to be taken care of after that. A, an orderly process of doing that and then, as you said, recognizing in a community what areas are inherently safer than others don't shake as hard and focusing attention in those areas uh, is one of the keys. Okay. Thank you very much. Chair now recognizes Mr. Wu for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. McConnell, you mentioned in your testimony, this is really a question for, for all, all of the witnesses, uh, you mentioned that, um, that one study found that uh, up to 38 percent of Oregon's highway bridges would fail in the case of a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and that it would take uh, potentially five years to repair and replace uh, these damaged bridges, and this would leave some communities, especially coastal communities, uh, cut off from the rest of the state for a number of years. And can, can you all comment on how uh, we are trying to design resiliency uh, into crucial lifelines, and as Mr. Poland has said, uh, also work on, on workarounds uh, for, for some of these uh, uh, where we cannot uh, uh, design in uh, survivability in the first round? Uh, Chair Quayle and Mr. Wu, I appreciate that question and the comment. Uh, that particular study was uh, uh, designed and taken and carried forth by the Oregon Department of Transportation. And uh, they did use the data and information that was gleaned from NEHERP whenever they developed their scenario. So that's very important to bring this back around is how are we using those information and data that are coming out of NEHERP for very practical questions like are the bridges going to be there if we have that type of earthquake? Doesn't matter if the roads are there or if you can't get across the bridge. Um, so what I would like to say in, in, uh, in answer to your question is in, in building resiliency and as Mr. Poland said, you must recognize and prioritize those infrastructure, those buildings, those parts of the community that you really need to have there both during and immediately after. So yes, it would take us three to five years to fix every one of those bridges, but maybe not every one of those bridges need to be fixed right off. What we need to do is recognize where are those priority lifelines, and particularly the ones to the coast, that need those bridges fixed. And those are the ones you start. Those are the ones you focus on. And we are actually working with, and I say we, the state of Oregon, working with the Department of Transportation, um, emergency management, uh, a variety of other agencies, and working with our federal partners toward developing those type of, in, of identifying the infrastructure that really needs the first look at and to try to, to fix those first as we work through the, these kind of pro projects. Because otherwise you look at it and you just say, this is going to cost so much 
and it's going to take so long we can't get our arms around it. But we absolutely can. You just have to think strategically. And it engages everyone, not just the earthquake, not just these programs that work on earthquakes or work on earthquake science, but the Department of Transportation. Those types of uh, agencies as well need to be in, um, incorporated into these discussions. Thank you very much. Mr. Poland? Well, it's fine if you have nothing further to add. I have, not, I have nothing further to add. Okay, terrific. Dr. Hayes, uh, your agency works on uh, developing some model codes, and that applies to buildings, I, I believe, and also potentially to, uh, to bridges and other structures. Do you want to comment on this uh, from the perspective of critical infrastructure? We, we don't do work. Uh, on on bridges and other and those kinds of structures, the Federal Highway Administration is is primarily responsible for that. We do focus on the, on the building side of the of the problem, if you will. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that we have a long way to go to have a completely coordinated approach to our lifelines in virtually every major city uh, in in the United States. That that's an area that I think that the advisory committee that Mr. Poland chairs as well as this NRC report that he referred to, have, have mentioned as an area that we really need to be looking at as we go into the future. It, it's an area that is not as well established as the buildings area is. There's no question about that. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayes. Uh, my second question before my time runs out is that uh, we, we do have a num number of nuclear reactors that are sitting on active seismic zones, and I believe one of them is on the West Coast. Uh, can, can you all comment on what can be done to uh, build resiliency and recovery uh, into these uh, nuclear facilities? Uh, you know, what we found in Japan is that uh, it wasn't the earthquake, it was the tsunami and the loss of electricity, and it affected both the reactor itself and the fuel that was stored on, uh, in pools on top of the reactor facility. Uh, can, can you all comment on how we can do a better job with our own nuclear facilities? You're looking at me, so I'll give you a short answer. Um, <laughs> NEHRP itself does not address the nuclear facilities in the United States. That's the responsibility of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. So we, we really don't directly get engaged with that. However, we have frequent communications with the folks over in Rockville at NRC, and in fact, the day the day before the her horrendous earthquake in Japan hit, um, we had a young, uh, a young staffer from the uh, NRC briefing the NEHRP Advisory Committee on the activities there. There are many interactions that occur between the USGS and the National uh, Reg Nuclear Regulatory Commission, excuse me, um, that are, are tied to examining the ground motions and the propagations of those motions uh, following an earthquake. So there is interaction there, but it's not a formal responsibility of the program. I would just like to add that the uh, design process that has been done for nuclear power plants uh, since their inception has been extraordinarily rigorous and uh, much more detailed and much more carefully done than for any other kind of construction by many orders of magnitude. Uh, our facilities, our nuclear facilities, from a standpoint of strong shaking, are the safest buildings that we have uh, in the nation. The, uh, the problem in Japan, as you mentioned, had to do with the tsunami, and it wasn't that they didn't think they were going to have a tsunami. They had a wall. The wall wasn't tall enough. Uh, the backup systems didn't work as well as they thought that they would. All of that would be factored into the programs that we have now, just like they're being done, and, and that extra level of redundancy will be added. Our nuclear power plants are designed with many, many levels of redundancy, and you've got to look at what the worst cases are. They do a better job of that. Uh, looking at our power plants that are on the West Coast, it's my understanding that we, we're not facing that same kind of tsunami issue, but it's causing a reevaluation and, and consideration of what's being done. But I, I just wanted to add that, that this is a much higher level of consideration and sophisticated design that's done anywhere else. I'll, I might follow up uh, later. Uh, 
Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you and uh, particularly the full committee chairman for scheduling such a timely hearing uh, given what has occurred recently in Japan. And let me confess at the outset that my first question is directed towards Dr. Hayes and second to Mr. Poland and confess that it is a very provincial question. Uh, so I hope you'll excuse that. And it is this. Over the last several weeks, the Texas Advanced Computing Center in Austin, which is part of my district, came to the assistance of Tokyo's Earthquake Research Institute and other scientists in Japan who reached out to them when Japan's own high-performance supercomputers to research earthquake tremor scenarios and radiation dispersal simulations were knocked offline due to power outages. The question, Dr. Hayes, is this. How much does the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, which you manage, uh, rely on supercomputing capabilities, and how much do you invest in supercomputing capabilities for earthquake research? I can't give you a quantitative answer because I've, I've never actually attempted to gather that specific information. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, much of the work that's being done at both the national or sponsored by the National Science Foundation and by USGS involves the use of supercomputers. I, I would have to find out more specific information for you. Obviously, where it's appropriate to use them, they're, they're being used in the research that, that, is, that is being performed. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hayes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Poland, second question is, does your advisory committee find the current level of investment in supercomputing adequate? And given the tight budgets, in what research areas would you recommend a higher or lower level of investment uh, for earthquake research? You know, quite honestly, our advisory committee has not considered or discussed the investment in supercomputers. Maybe I'm giving you and Mr. Dr. Hayes some new ideas here today. Uh, do you think you will get to that? Uh, I do. I do believe that we will. I think that supercomputing gives us the ability to do a, a community-wide simulation and detailed building simulation and simulation of systems. Uh, they're, they're necessary to do the, 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 the kind of estimation of what the damage is going to be. Okay. I think that that level of simulation is going to be very necessary for us to move forward and, and figure out what we need to do to make our systems more resilient. Okay. Now let me know what, you, what additional research you do on that subject, if you would. Uh, last question is this. It has to do with the budget. And let me ask each of the panelists if they would to give a very, very quick response. Uh, you don't necessarily have to limit it to good or bad, but uh, be as brief as you can. In the fiscal year 2012 budget request currently before Congress, the President's Office of Management and Budget canceled uh, NASA's uh, deformation, ecosystem structure, and dynamics of ICE satellite mission, which would monitor for and anticipate earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, and glacial ice sheet changes, and other practical applications in favor of other NASA satellite missions uh, to monitor greenhouse gases. Uh, how will that cancellation affect uh, earthquake research? And Dr. Hayes, let's just go down real quickly, if you could. Sir, I'll have to find out more information for you on that. Since NASA is not a part of the NEHR program, we don't directly deal with that. We were aware of that cancellation. Uh, actually, it was made aware to the advisory committee about three weeks ago, and it's Maybe I should make it easy for you. Can it be good? That the can, <laughs> can the cancellation be good? I mean, there's some... Uh, common sense involved here, too. Well, I don't mean to be evasive, but I'm a structural engineer like Mr. Poland is, and okay. so I don't know a good answer to that question. I'll be glad to find out for you. We'll go to the, Mr. Mullen, then. Thank you. Uh, sir, I can only say that um, I'm a consumer of research. I, it's best if I don't try to produce too much. Um, any information I get, I'll be, I'll be happy to okay. use as an emergency manager. Okay. Uh, Mr. Poland? As I mentioned, one of the, the biggest uncertainties we have is when and where and how strong the earthquakes are going to occur. Right. Uh, we are looking forward to the day when we have clear information. There is reason to believe that satellite observation is going to give us some of that information. That's a hope, and in that sense, it's important. How much will it affect our work today? Not very much. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. McConnell. Uh, thank you. The uh, uh, satellite in mention here uh, with the acronym DESTINY is uh, of, of great interest to looking at building baseline topographic information uh, for areas that may be vulnerable to earthquakes, volcano hazards, etc. You can then, because what you're looking at through both INSAR and LIDAR, which are acronyms for uh, uh, types of digital imaging, is 
what are there changes? Are there subtle changes in the topography that may be indicating that we have stresses building up or that we have uh, inflation occurring in volcanic areas? These are something we're very sensitive to when we're doing hazards monitoring. And uh, this particular uh, satellite would be of great interest to, to broadening our monitoring capabilities and looking at what we call interferometry. Good to hear. Thank you, Dr. McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And before I recognize our next questioner, um, I just wanted to let everybody know that there actually has been another earthquake that hit off the, the east coast of Japan just an hour and a half ago, um, magnitude about 7.5. We've just been notified. So our thoughts and prayers are definitely with the, uh, the people of Japan right now. Um, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you to the panel. If the if all of the measures you would like to see put in place with resiliency and preparation and recovery and so forth um, represent, say, 100 on a scale of 1 to 100, where would you say we are on that scale um, as a nation right now? Anybody want to try to quantify that? One to a hundred. We're talking about uh, here with the, with the uh, the federal investment in, involved in developing tools and knowledge and implementation programs. Uh, I would think we're down in the 25 range. We have a fair set of tools that are expensive to use. We have a set of implementation programs that would help uh, states and regions become more resilient, uh, but they're not really being implemented right now, and so we're really at, at a at a very low level. So we're. At in the 20s out of 100 in terms of investing our attention and resources to the problem. But in terms of our preparedness as a nation, according to the standards you would set um, to be enough prepared for the kinds of scenarios that you model, where are we on that scale from 1 to 100? I guess they're going to let me talk. I'd say it's even lower, maybe 10. Okay. We have only had, let me just, just say quickly that in areas of very high seismicity in California, Oregon, and Washington, there have been building codes in place for 20 years that are going to help people be safe. All part, other parts of the country that we talk about, those things are not in place and they're not in force. Well, that was the next question I wanted to ask you. I assume that the West Coast would be higher on the scale um, than other places. So California, would you, where would you put that? From, from a scale of safety, I believe that, that California will be maybe 50 or 60. On a scale of resilience to be able to recover quickly and not have a significant impact on the national economy, we're still down in the 10, 20 range. Okay. Humans are notoriously short-sighted about everything. Um, and even with the earthquake activity of, of recent days, uh, we'll get back to being short-sighted even on this question. And I, I wondered if you could speak to, I mean, I, I would imagine if you went to any, any budget hearing at, at a local level, at a city at, at municipality level, or at the state level, if, if earthquake preparation and resiliency was was even on the budget document it would be on the last page on the on the last line because there's so many other things obviously that are pulling on our resources and our attention so it, it makes me wonder how much you and I think you've spoken to this a little bit but the the opportunity to um, piggyback the kinds of things you want to see done on to other kinds of initiatives that are out there that, that have greater priority in the minds of planners and budgeters and all the rest of it so that you can kind of come along and for with a little bit of leverage and not so much added cost say, well, as long as you're doing X, Y, and Z, why not add this into the mix? And that can that can go to codes and building um, standards and so forth, but it also could go particularly well with community resiliency planning 
Um, and I, I wanted, wondered if you could speak to that and maybe throw in whether sort of green building codes and sustainable uh, building codes are ones where there can be some, some added uh, elements with respect to uh, resiliency and, and so forth. Thank you. Uh, sir, let me try to help with some of that. Um, I will tell you that on the West Coast there, there are significant discussions taking place in uh, local communities about earthquakes and tsunami threats and measures that should be taken. One of the things we haven't really talked about is the importance of the general public understanding not only the risk they face, but the measures they can take to protect themselves. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about getting a warning about something that might ha be coming, like the tsunami warning that we got a few weeks ago really helped us. But the type of events, the no-notice events that we would deal with in the central Puget Sound or in Oregon or in, on the coast, they're not going to get a lot of warning for an earthquake. And, and one of the things that we need to do is make sure people are prepared to take the protective steps that they need immediately. They need to be able to drop cover and hold. They need to know that they've got uh, uh, that they need to have some resources for themselves. Uh, and in, on the coast, uh, we've been working very hard with the communities about their evacuation programs, knowing when, what it means to move quickly. Uh, the ground motion in an earthquake that's right off our coast is your signal. We also have an elaborate system of warning systems that we can activate to tell people to move to high ground. The difficulty we have, the challenge that communities have as they prepare with us and they work with us is there is not a vertical evacuation site that is necessarily readily available to every community. And so we've been trying to plan for the type of vertical evacuation structure that would be necessary on, a, on the coast in Port Angeles or Long Beach or Iwako where those folks can get to a place of safety, so, uh, which may not be the, the warmest, driest place, but it will at least be above any kind of potential wave. That's an important step. There is no such structure right now, but the communities are planning with it. I think the key to this whole thing that you're getting at in terms of where people are, and I would not hazard a guess about the scale because I, I would just be making something up, but I will tell you that the, if you educate people about the risks that they face and you're level with people about what they can do to protect themselves and their families, uh, whether it's uh, the average citizen, someone with a, running a business or the emergency management community or the local elected officials, you begin to generate the kind of interest that will get people looking at this as another issue that they have to deal with and it'll move it up on that committee agenda. Uh, and then the national level exercise I spoke of in my testimony is an attempt at the, in the Midwest, in eight Midwestern states, to begin to educate people as w at the same time that we're determining whether our doctrines and plans are going to work for us or not. That'll be an extremely challenging exercise. We expect failure to occur because we want to find out what our, what our condition is. So we're very eager to find out where we're weak, where we've got strengths, and make sure we capitalize on the strengths and shore up the weaknesses. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for uh, inviting a very capable uh, group of witnesses here and don't judge uh, our interest or our appreciation of you by empty seats here because it's kind of a desperate time up here right now. We're all looking for a bus ticket home or, or how long we're going to have to stay here. But, uh, and the question, but in, in this day and time of the hurricanes, the uh, Tsumi, the earthquakes and other vicissitudes of nature, your, your testimony is very timely and very important to us. And, uh, we have probably the hardest working man in the entire hearing room sits to my left here, and he's taking down everything that's said. And all these members will be given copies of your answers. And you're you're not in vain when you're just talking to our very capable chairman and and ranking members and a few of us here. So I thank you for that. That's all I really want to say. We had a hearing some 15 years ago on asteroids and. Uh, with the thought in mind of getting everybody in the world to work together for some timely and to, to determine whether or not. And I learned at that hearing something that I didn't know then uh, and hadn't even heard that an asteroid had just passed Earth and it, by their testimony only missed us by about 15 minutes sometime in the 80s. And those are things that 
people like you live with every day and know about that we don't know about, and we cast our legislation based on the testimony of folks like you that are kind enough to prepare yourself, leave your offices, come here and give us your testimony. And I thank this good chairman and Mr. Wu for <clears throat> gathering such a good group here and asking proper questions. And I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fleischman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wu, um, this is a particularly pertinent uh, uh, subcommittee hearing and, and topic, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to participate. And also, Chairman Hall, I want to thank you. Uh, I'm one of those freshmen to the witnesses, and it's been a great privilege. I serve on three committees and um, represent the Oak Ridge area, so I've got the lab and Y-12. Uh, but the hearings that we've been having in science, space, and technology and the tremendous leadership from Chairman Hall and, and I think bipartisan cooperation has been outstanding on these issues. So I thank you for being here. Um, and our thoughts and prayers go out to the people of Japan. Um, I was unaware of that, Mr. Chairman, about another earthquake. I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, I have some questions. I think I will start uh, with uh, Dr. Hayes, if I may. Uh, Dr. Hayes, what is NEHRP's relationships with other countries, and uh, what are other countries' federal earthquake research and development programs? How are they different or similar to ours? I don't know that there's another country that does it quite the way we do it. Um, I, I think that that's largely because different governments are organized in different ways. But we, we really have many international partnerships within the, the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. Uh, probably right at the moment, probably what would be most of interest to, to all of you all is the fact that we work very closely uh, with uh, the Japanese. Um, there are two bilateral uh, committees or panels that uh, are involved with earthquake-related issues between the U.S. and Japan. Uh, one is in the seismological area. It's called it, it, the basic title of it is, is earthquake research, and the other is in the engineering area, wind and seismic effects. Um, we are in close contact with the Japanese, uh, my counterparts, with uh, the Japanese uh, part of the committee that I co-chair with the United States side and I have been in frequent contact for the last several weeks since the earthquake hit there and, and we fully anticipate that we'll be going over there once things have passed into a, a study stage from where they are now, still response and recovery and the radiation issues are resolved. We, we'll be working closely with them. The National Science Foundation works very closely with their Japanese counterparts, the world's largest experimental facility what we call a shaking table that you can build models on and, and actually subject them to earthquake effects is just outside of Kobe, Japan, between Kobe and Kyoto. And we actually have cooperative projects where U.S. funded projects are placed on that shaking table and U.S. and Japanese researchers work literally side by side on those projects. And we typically meet every September to review the kinds of technical issues that are being performed. Uh, at the moment, there is a group from the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, with one person from NIST, my office, uh, in New Zealand, uh, examining some of the damage that occurred in the Christchurch earthquake a few weeks ago as well. USGS has far more uh, bilateral arrangements of that kind because the ground issues are the same no matter what national border is in place, whereas the built environment can depend greatly upon the, the, the society in which you're, you're examining the issues. And so USGS does a lot more with the other countries uh, than, than the rest of us, but we work with, with many other countries all the time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. McConnell, how, if at all, do the costs of preparing for earthquakes diminish as you become more prepared? Uh, once a community reaches a certain level of preparation, can its annual investment be reduced? And uh, how, do you how do you measure a community's level of resilience? Well, I guess I'll tackle that last one first, is that I'm, I'm not sure that we have a ability to quantify how you measure a community's level of resilience. What we, uh, what we would look at, excuse me, <clears throat> what we would, would really look at is um, have, they, have they met certain goals 
depending on what their their hazard is that they are that they are looking at. And and I'll use an example of coastal communities that have a um, uh, on the Oregon coast that have both the earthquake hazard from the Cascadia subduction zone and impending tsunami, both a local tsunami and distant tsunamis as we see that they um, had to deal with uh, after the Tohoku uh, earthquake. So um, as you invest in your infrastructure and your built environment based on good earthquake research and tsunami research, where are the areas that are in the inundation zones, where are your building codes, and where are your land use decision making. As you build up that infrastructure in the built environment, what you really need to shift your work on and that we are uh, realizing is, as Mr. Mullen said earlier, it's on the outreach and the education. Because you're, the demographics of our communities aren't that everyone is there, that they've seen everything that's happened, that their grandparents live in the same community that they live in, and that, they, that this um, um, kind of a level of awareness is ingrained in the communities. So you, yes, you would invest less in your infrastructure, and you would begin to invest more in continuing that education and outreach so that you stay resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fleischman. Um, the chair now recognizes Mr. Wu for a quick follow-up. Uh, thank you very much. And with that uh, request for a quick follow-up and the good example of the uh, full committee's chair, uh, I will uh, submit a question about uh, um, uh, about codes uh, for the record and ask the witnesses to uh, to respond there. And just a very quick follow-up on the nuclear power uh, issue. The reactors that we have at San Onofre and Diablo Canyon and I believe at Hanford are all uh, pressure reactor uh, and, and you know, require electricity uh, to circulate water through them. And I realize now that this is an NRC issue, but there is a significant contact. There, there is a different model for reactors, and I believe that Oregon State University has been working on this for quite some time, and also um, a couple of other research centers. Um, and uh, this is a passive circulation system that doesn't require electricity. And I know that you all are not uh, experts in this field. Uh, but in terms of resiliency and the, and the conversations about resiliency that we have had, uh, if, if you all care to address this, and, and if not, we'll forward this question on to someone else. Uh, if you would care to address this, I would assume that, uh, that these smaller reactors that are very similar to the reactors that are in uh, nuclear-powered ships and submarines, that uh, a passive circulation system that does not require electrical power to circulate the, the coolants, that that would be an inherently more resilient system, uh, in, especially if they can be distributed uh, in, 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 say, five uh, reactors rather than uh, one uh, highly powered, uh, high pressure reactor. That's the question. What I would like to offer is to pass the question to my counterparts at, at NRC and, and get a well-informed answer for you. Um, anything I would say would be strictly speculative, but I'll be happy to try to help with, with answering the question by doing that. That's absolutely terrific. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think that – well, uh, I, I'm not going to go there about committee jurisdiction. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I find that answer very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wu. And uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable time and testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and statements from members. The witnesses are excused. Thank you all for coming. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.